small one, but now I'm scared. Looking at you, trying to see your star. Our next speaker uh, is Ofer. Um, I looked at the talk description briefly, and it looks like this will be very interesting. I'm a so I'm a programmer for a living, but um, I'm actually not a computer scientist. So every every time I see talks that are really really technical. Uh, about stuff that I've never learned, I'm amazed and just sit back and whoa. <laughs> so uh, have fun with this talk uh, and uh, give a welcome, please give a welcoming clap to Ofer. So good morning. This is a soft talk. It's not going to go deeply into machine learning. We can't do that in 25 minutes. But data science has been thrown around as a buzzword for the past about two or three years. And not a lot of people have discussed what data science is. And so let's just get this clear. So data science has many different manifestations. There is business intelligence, which was what was classically known as data science, meaning you'd had people sitting in the organization, sifting through the organization's data and using analytics and other stat statistic techniques to find out what, what next market would sh should we approach. This was nice and well until about five years ago. This was what data science was. And then we had the web. And suddenly you had a lot of new needs coming in. Uh, next big thing in data science is information retrieval. Everybody knows Google. We use Google every time. Google has to use quite a lot of data science to actually get the search results onto your page, to get it relevant, to get it localized for you. And the last one, this is my expertise, is predictive modeling, for example. That's what I'm going to talk about is saying, I have a website. I want to personalize your experience. How do I predict which experience would be best for you and best for me in terms in business-wise? Because basically, nobody's putting up websites for you to come and browse without getting something, some money out of it. And the question is, how do we get the most money out of it while making the experience good for you so you will come back and won't feel like we just you know, turned you upside down and, sh and shook you? So let's look at some examples first. The one everybody's familiar with in our community is LinkedIn and the people you may know. This little widget is a common example of data products and how they come up just because LinkedIn publicized it so well. But the basic need came up as a story, which was LinkedIn saying, we have people coming in to our site. We do not know why they're leaving, but nobody's staying for long. And we want to be a business. We want people staying here. And DJ Patil, the chief data scientist, said, let's look at this as a conference or a party. You come to a party, there's nobody you know. You're probably going to hang around, drink a beer, be very quiet, and probably leave. But the minute you meet people you know, you get much more comfortable. You start approaching new people. You start thinking about staying. So they had to sit down and figure out how do we tell who you know. And they started out very simply, just looking at the, simple, uh, the data you give them in the beginning. And they got the product so, so done so well now that you, every time you come in, you see people you didn't know were on LinkedIn, but they're there, you know them, it's nice for you, you can co connect, you can use it. Another one we're all familiar with is this little uh, thing, product recommendations. Product recommendation may look simple, but when you're in web scale and you have so many products, you have to have quite a lot of science behind it. My favorite example is what I call the Harry Potter problem. Assume you're in Amazon and you bought Harry Potter 1, you bought Harry Potter 2, and I need to recommend something to you. Which, what am I going to recommend to you? Now, the common reflex is saying Harry Potter 3. Is this a good use case? Does anybody think you should recommend Harry Potter 3? You're going to buy it anyway. I should recommend something which you're, quite fam you're not familiar with, but is similar. So right away, I have to decide what similar means. Do I use similar by what people bought, or do I use similar by what I know about the product? It's a book. It has words. I can do some, some things there. Quite, again, quite a lot of science needed to do something very simple. 
By the way, the answer is you never look at the content. You only care what other people did. Content tells you nothing. And as I said, the one we're all familiar with, I don't need to know, tell you what this does, but you know it helps you every day and it makes them quite a lot of money. But you couldn't do this without data science. Uh, PageRank, when it came out, came out, Google's algorithm was a revolution, saying, okay, this is how you take a very simple scientific mathematical concept, you scale it, and they had to scale quickly. They started with about, I think, two desktop computers under the desk. That was Google in the beginning in 97. And today, this has so much science behind it that they actually have uh, tenured professors living in academia going to work for them to get this better. Doing actual groundbreaking, not industrial science, but theoretical science. Okay, and this is my home base. Live person, anybody who's not familiar with live person, what we do is essentially give chat, a chat service. Give a better customer experience, but, and you can ask where's the data science there, but for example now, chat is very expensive. I need somebody on the other side of the chat talking to you. Now he's probably talking to you and about four or five other people. But if there are 100 people on the site, who am I gonna choose to offer chat to? If it was there just you know, to browse or annoy the salespeople, I need to recognize it. I do not want to spend time on you. If you actually need help, for example, in a service hotline, I want to find this quickly. I want to help you. I want you coming back to buy stuff. So there's quite a lot of signs going there of trying to predict which sort of customer you're gonna be. Now, if you notice something about this, I didn't mention technology yet. I was talking about algorithms, I was talking about stuff. I didn't say the Hadoop password, buzzword. I didn't say no SQL. There's a reason for that. Data science, for some reason, has been captured along with all these Hadoop implementations. And if you've ever been to a conference, you can see there's about 10 companies right now selling, I think, productized Hadoop uh, over Cloudera or over our distributions. And they're saying, do data science, buy Hadoop. We'll give you Hadoop, you can do data science. They're forgetting something very, very simple. Data science is not about the technology. The technology is there so you can answer the question. The big emphasis is always where you need to create creativity. You need to think like product people usually, most of the time, and not like engineers. What am I trying to answer? Is it LinkedIn trying to think how I'm getting you back into the site? Is it us trying to predict which uh, user we should offer a chat to? It's Google trying to decide how to, how to put their search results up. The technology is there for, uh, for answering this question. It's not there for playing with it. Uh, I cut a call about three months back from a recruiter saying, come work for us, we have an Hadoop. And I was saying, what do you do with the Hadoop? And they said, no, we have a Hadoop. <laughs> it's quite common. And the other thing is with buzzwords, and this is another uh, nice thing to understand is, we have a Hadoop. Well, how much data do you have it? We have two gigabytes a day, which is okay. So go buy a Terra hard drive, put it on, and you don't need a data scientist. You need to understand what the questions are first. This is, if you take one thing from here, this is the important stuff. Data science is not about the engineering, it's about finding which question to ask. It's a science. And let's, let's get this buzzword out of the way. Data science is not about big data. Big data is how we do data science nowadays. But you can also have data science if you have 10,000 people coming to your site every day. You know, something you can put into SQL and the server won't even heat up. But it's still data science. When is it big data? It's big data when the actual scale becomes a part of the problem. And we were talking about uh, LinkedIn. Imagine LinkedIn had 10,000 users and they all knew each other. You could hold that quite comfortably on a desktop. Now imagine you take the same problem and you put it in LinkedIn scale. I have this, or Facebook scale, which is, I think, to the order of magnitude beyond LinkedIn's at least. So I have this huge social graph. I can't hold it on one machine. I can't do a simple clustering even simple trying to find out who your immediate friends were can take you to quite many machines because there's no guarantee you and I are even the same cluster being served by Facebook. I have no idea how they handle it, how they shout it, but every time you solve a data science problem in Facebook, I'm sure, I'm sure they ask, how does this scale? 
can we scale it? If we can't scale it, then don't do it. If our question is extremely interesting, but we're going to need two weeks every time to get the answer because you can't do it web scale, don't do it. So this is big data. It's not about you know, having a lot of storage because face it, banks had big data in the 70s. Banks had everything you were doing and they were keeping all your transactions and everything you paid and everything that was owed you and all your actions. Why wasn't it big data? You never really cared about thinking about all the users. Let's see what uh, Offer was doing. Oh, he, was, he's owe, he owes us some money, he owes him some money, here's his balance. You never say, okay, let's get the net average balance of everyone in the bank. It's not an interesting question, and if it was, they probably get daily reports running on the mainframe and get it. But every time you walk into Facebook or LinkedIn, we have to get, give you relevant results right now. We can't do pre-processing pre all the time. We can do it once a day. Imagine that Facebook updated once a day. Would it be usable? It would be worthless. Imagine the Twitter said, okay, thank you for tweeting this. Uh, we're going to tell you how many people retweeted or faved this in about two weeks. So come back. Not going to work. So this is big data, and this is all I'm going to say about big data right now. It's important, but it's not data science. Data science, again, is the right question and how you answer it. So let's talk about the basic loop of data science. So the basic loop, as we said, you start with a question. Now I wrote here in little, little sentence, examine the data. And this is a big, big lie, because I have to say the big part of data science is actually getting the data in a form which you can use it. You usually have malformed data. There's a lot of missing values. You have to decide what you're going to look at and what you're going to replace with values. Sometimes you have different data sources. Uh, try to get uh, a better search engine, you're going to get results from sca scraping Wikipedia, scraping any open API you can use, getting all this data in, and now you want to answer a general question. None of the data looks the same at all. Before you can even decide what to use, you have to, you have to get into some form which you can run over. Even though there's quite a lot of hard decisions, because Sometimes you make a slightly wrong decision in the beginning, saying, I'll keep this aggregate here, or I'll forget this a little bit. It's not important, I can't generalize it, so I'm not going to think about missing values. About two months or three months down the line, it's going to bite you. So the little thing here is a lie. Examine the data, it's the most important thing. You don't get the data correct, none of your results are going to matter. They're nice, but you know, they're ba basically just generate the data using random streams. Question? Yes. Uh, so you should start with the question of what I want to get. You have to think about, your thing, let's say we were LinkedIn, and you were thinking, let's try to see people you may know. And we were LinkedIn in the beginning. We don't have a lot. So we go and look at the data you fed in, and we have to get in some form, and then we have to, start to understand how to cluster it to say that uh, you might know me geographically. So you have to go and get geographical data. Now, geographical data, you comes from geographical databases, looks completely different from LinkedIn. You have an, any idea how many times people can, how many different ways people can write California? Spelling errors, CA, CA.USA, I've seen everything. So you have to get this done somehow, and you have to get used to missing some of it. But then you have to understand what to do when I got it wrong. Is it 50% uh, wrong 50% of the time? It's wrong 1% of the time? Getting the data in a form you can use, and I'm not talking about JSON or XML, even though I wouldn't touch XML with, you know, poll, but you have to get the data somehow reasonable so you can work with it. Now, the second thing is to perform basic analysis. Okay, I had this nice idea. I have some data. I, I didn't go and scrape the entire web. I have 10,000, 20,000 pieces of data. Do they make sense? Does my original idea even work here? Because if it doesn't work in 20,000, you sometimes say people, see people saying, okay, it didn't work in 20,000. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to see something statistically significant in one million. So you spend another month getting your million people and get finding out that your lovely uh, migration script gets an exception in 999,000. You have to start again. And then you see that it's even less significant because that's the way statistics works. If, it, if, if you're going to see noise, it's actually going to get smaller 
once you get more data. So if you are not seeing anything in 20,000, drop the idea. It's bad. Or go back and see what data I'm missing. Third step. Okay, so I have an idea. I have the data. It seems to make some sense. I have to figure out how I'm going to check this, how I'm going to test it. This is the scientific process. I have to think out, think about, I'm going to generate this. People, you may know graph for LinkedIn. How am I going to test this? Can I validate it on my offline data? Do I need to run this online? What's a good outcome? What's a bad outcome? Too many times people come in into this process and say, okay, we'll just put it up and see what happens. Unless you put in some way of measuring it in the beginning, you're wasting your time. You're wasting the company's time. You can't do this without understanding some metric, and it can't be a soft metric. Oh, I think they stayed a little bit more longer. If we're going to measure this by bounce rate, then bounce rate is king. The bounce rate didn't go up. Something is, uh, didn't go down. Something here is wrong. You have to get hard analysis in at this stage. You have to understand what you're going to measure. You didn't measure, you're not doing anything. You're not doing data science, you're doing you know, gut feelings. By the way, it's a, it's a common experience of mine that that's where data science and marketing usually collides. And the market data science pe people are the ones in the room saying, you know, it's a nice idea, but it's a market idea. It's not really working. And, you know, the marketer is sitting there and protecting himself saying, no, I'm sure it has to work this way. If the data doesn't say it, it's not happening. Unless you show me what I collected wrong. But the data science has to be the scientist in the room. He has to be there sitting down and breaking his own ideas. Just to reiterate, when we, in my team, when we develop something, an idea, we don't start with, oh, this is a nice idea, I'll go and run it. We throw it out in the room, and everybody takes out his metaf metaphorical baseball bat, and we start beating the idea down. Now, we try to do it, you know, without hurting the one who suggested the idea, but he has to be quite strong to take it, because we're going to tear it down. And if, in the end, there's still an idea there, then you run with it. But you have to formulate this scientifically. You have to say, if we don't see the bounce rate going down, this didn't work. If we didn't see revenues go up, this did not work. Now, the next step, as I said, okay, we formulate the idea, now let's go validate it. You have, again, the measurable metric. If I can't measure this, if I can't say in two weeks, in two days, preferably in one hour, I'm not seeing better results, this does not work. Now, the fifth step is where we usually fail, and I failed this quite many times, the productize. What usually happens, do you think? You do three, one, two, three, then you do five, and then you do four. <laughs> so you spent two months writing it and getting all the serialization going on and the NoSQL databases and your Hadoop is running smoothly, everything is being served and measured and validated, the idea doesn't work. What, what did we do wrong? It's more than that. It's not that we didn't validate, it's that we forgot that this is 2013. The engineers have already been for this, going from waterfall to agile. Agile methodology has to work here also. You need ideas which you can iterate quickly on. If your idea takes a year to get up and three months to validate, you're not doing anyone a service, especially not you. Figure out how to get something there out there fast. The people you may meet on LinkedIn, it's a good example again, they got the, the call going and I think about a week. They used a the widget for ads on LinkedIn, so it didn't build anything. They knew how to track clicks on the widget. They just worked out some script that took about three or four parameters, figured out something initial and saw that it had impact. People were clicking, people were interacting. Then they went and productized it and got it up to web scale and got it to work and got it to update continuously. But I can tell you that I had a product where we did all those things. Product recommendation, we got it to scale, we got it to generate automatically, you actually didn't have to touch it anymore. Customer fed you the information by tags, recommendations were generated. It didn't work so well because we recommended Harry Potter 3 instead of doing something more interesting. But we spent about three months building it before we actually deployed and started measuring. So again, another good point for takeaway is step five is important. You can't skip it. You can't say, okay, this is a nice script. Some engineers are going to implement it. I'm going to do something else. If you're a data science scientist, own your code. 
you're responsible for the production also. It's very nice that you have this nice algorithm, but if you wrote it the way that it generates bugs and the runs correctly, you're not doing your job. But don't do this. Don't spend the time up front. Get your ideas checked. When they work, go productize. And to help you with this, if you do decide to go this way, here are the three most important things you can take from here. Know your tools. You want to solve a data science pro problem? I said you have to scrub your data. You have to be able to get your data in a format which you can use, you can count. Now, what would be the wrong thing to do? Go write a lot of stuff. For example, um, I wrote this script, not me, but uh, I had a guy came, saying, come, come up to me and say, I wrote this script, it scrapes the HTML and gets this important stuff we need. And I, say, I looked at him and I said, okay, you wrote? He said, yeah, I have this nice little Scala script, it works. Now he's new, he just got a PhD in math, so he's not from here. Okay, grep said, Unix solved this. Unix solved it well. It took him about five minutes, it took you two days to write the script. Now that's fine to do it once, but there are uh, tons of to tools out there to the text processing. Unix is probably the best thing that ever happened. And I've managed to save, I think, 90% of some project time just by using grep and sed to do a simple pre-process of the file before I go and run a script on it. Know your other tools. If you just want to generate something quickly, don't run, write, uh, sit down and write this predictive modeling engine from scratch. It's been solved. There's MATLAB, there's R, there's quite a lot of free stuff. Try to use the free stuff first. You're probably not going to stay there. I had to write my own predictive modeling engine because I had actually a software difficulty. Uh, the things were existing in 2008 weren't fast enough, so I had to customize the data structure so I could actually get this built on a machine. It was 2008, I couldn't distribute it very well. So I had to go in there, but I first had to know my tools. And by the way, even then I probably failed because if I spent another month looking, I could probably have solved this in less than two, it, it took. So know your tools. Second thing, if you're afraid of statistics, if you're not comfortable with math, if the idea of probability or an integral or sums scare you, don't do data science. It's, very, it's that simple. If I give you an, a paper with simple math and you tell me I need your help with implementing the, this determinant or I'm getting an exception because my variance is negative, you're in the wrong field. That's fine. Not everybody has to be a mathematician. Not everybody has to be a statistician. But if you're not comfortable with numbers, with analytics, this is the wrong field. Now, if you're comfortable with numbers and analytics, programming is the easy stuff. You might not be the star programmer. You're not going to be the one guys writing the amazing frameworks we have nowadays, uh, Storm, Scouting, stuff like that. But you can look at the numbers and understand what they mean. I've had people, I've had, I found myself talking to people at conferences saying, we're doing A-B testing. And I asked them, what do you use for the statistical significance? What sort of measure? And they looked at me like I was speaking gibberish. And it turns out they were afraid of math. So they had A-B testing, but there was no math around it. So basically, you ran version A against version B. You looked at the numbers. It didn't matter there wasn't enough traffic. The difference wasn't similar enough. They told you version A won. This was always noise. And about a year later, they actually folded, which isn't surprising. Because math is important. Again, you don't have to understand and be able to talk about random variables and distribution and stuff like that. But if you're not comfortable with basic statistics, basic math, not a good field. And the number three, and it's the hardest, it's the hardest for all of us. We're humans, we don't like criticism. We don't like our lovely idea which we spent a week coding failing. Don't fall in love with your ideas. They're not your kids. Fall in love with your kids, with your wife, have good friends, but your ideas, if they don't work, take them out behind the shed and shoot them. I spent too many times spending days, as I said, trying to get something to work, which basically couldn't work. The statistics weren't there, there wasn't enough data there, there wasn't enough traffic there. Just because I didn't know, like, as I said, like any human saying, okay, this is a failure, let's out over. And by the way, number three, if there are, are there any managers here? Uh, CTOs, VPs, anyone? Okay, so 
your managers are not going to understand you. We can say this quite firmly. It's going to take them time if you decide to go the data science route. This is not like engineering, even if it has engineering. Engineering is quantifiably easier in terms of development risks. It might have research risks, but there's development risks. You know, you know what you're going to do. You're writing something which takes data from here to there, scrubs it, does lovely things to it. You can usually put a price tag on it, saying it's going to take a month. Everybody knows it's going to take three. It's fine. We're used to it. Data science is basically, okay, so we have this idea. We worked in a month. We took us about three months to deploy because anything to takes a month takes three months. We know that. And then it didn't work. So you go back to the lab and you bang it around a bit and it's already running for customers and management is panicking. Why isn't this working? Because we never ran it or real data until now. So now we get to do the fun stuff and fix it and reiterate and reiterate and fix it again. And finally it did work. But this is a lesson which is how to take for developers. When you ship, you're just starting the fun part. You shipped. That's it. You have no guarantee. Even if you checked in on two customers and it worked well, number eight is going to break you. Number eight is going to have a different use case or something different. Um, I can give you a nice little anecdote. In my last company, we had a content uh, targeting system where you actually did A-B testing, but you could also do the A-B testing intelligently, meaning I'm not going to do A-B testing. I just want to drive up revenue. So you have ads at A, ad B, ad C. You're on a page and we want to pick which ad to show you. Now, for clicks, this worked amazingly well. We had sites where we could get the click rate up 100%, 200% with corresponding revenues just by showing the correct ad. And then we said, okay, clicks was nice. Let's target conversions. So we had this little uh, loop where you first targeted clicks just because there's more clicks. But as you started getting conversions, the model shifted automatically. It had no human component from doing clicks to doing conversions. We wrote it, uh, we hired a new guy, he sat down, he took my machine, he implemented it, looks nice, right? Put it on, doesn't work. We started looking at the data and the entire management is panicking. You spent two months on this, why isn't this working? Turns out that clicking actually works better to drive revenues. Why? Because I see an ad and I click. If I just look at conversions, you saw an ad and you bought. Do I know if you looked at the ad? Do I know if you even noticed the ad? Could be that the, the ad was behind, below the fold in the laptop, which actually happened in one site. So what am I essentially modeling? I'm modeling noise. You never looked at the ad, you never interacted with the ad. I had conversions attached to what you were doing, but I was doing noise. And then we sat down, we fixed it so you actually had this ensemble of clicks and conversions. Everything things started taking properly. Only three months after we said it would. Lesson to be learned, you finish developing, that's nice. Now the work begins. Now you have to try to see if what you actually developed works and if it scales, and if it scales logically, not software-wise. Does this work for everybody? Do we need to do many manual steps? For example, you may figure out that it, step, it scales if you fix this for every customer you have with some basic parameters, but the computer can't guess them, you can guess them. Is this a good product? No. It's a horrible product. You're not going to be able to scale. You want 100,000 customers, you're going to have to have 100,000 deployment engineers. I don't see a future in that. So basically, you have to go where the machine configures itself. It's another development cycle. So don't fall in love with your ideas and understand that even if they seem correct, it's going to take you quite a lot of time. Now, do you have any time left? Because actually wrote a little data science application just to show the process. Okay. Just a little time. Yeah, but come ahead. So I can do about four more minutes of this and then we take questions. So I thought it's a nice product. Does anybody here use Twitter? It's okay. So I thought people tweet, but we were not actually tweeting for ourselves. No, let's let's not kid ourselves. It's an egotistical process. We care when we're being favorited, we care when we're being retweeted. Now, this can be productized, meaning, assuming I was doing the social media for a company, when do I tweet so the most Im I would have the most impact? And how do I measure impact? I get the most retweets. More people are going to see this tweet. So basically what I did is say, let's take my Twitter API. It's a nice data source. I pulled my tweet stream. 
uh, got, got it done, so I had enough examples, and I was saying, let's look at the tweets, not mentions, not replies, stuff like that, just the tweets where I, where I put out a tweet and it was retweeted, Ex uh, versus the times where it wasn't, and see if I can say something nice about, should I, retwe should I, should I retweet now? Is this a good time? Am I going to get nice tweeting getting out of it? So what I did is the usual data science cycle. You choose your features. You split your data into training and evaluation, saying, OK, I have two or three months of data. I'm going to use two months to model, and I'm going to validate it in one month. Luckily, this is a case where we can do offline validation. Because we can say, OK, I build a model on old data. I test it on new data. If the model works, we can go live. If it don't, doesn't work there, it's not going to work live, so don't waste time. Again, idea doesn't work, kill it. I modeled it, and this is the place where you have to know math. You have to figure out what you're modeling. You have to know machine learning. You don't have to know very deep machine learning, but you have to figure out what you're doing because the technique you choose is going to impact your results. If you choose a very difficult technique, you might get better results, but you can't scale it. If you choose something simple, you might get worse results, but you can do it in R, which is actually what I did. Again, validate it on the evaluation, and then figure out what's, what's the next step. I got the, the, I got the low-hanging fruit. What do I do next? So I decided on very two simple features. I have a date. I care about when to tweet. So let's for, forget about everything else. Forget about content. Content is hard. Doing NLP is hard, especially in Hebrew. And I tweet mostly in Hebrew. So I said, let's go simple. Day of the week, hour of day. Why don't we use the date? But why do we use the day of the week and the hour of the day? Day of the uh, date sucks. It's never going to come back. Assuming the model tells me, yeah, do all your tweets on August 8th, 2013. Excellent model. It's going to be very useful if I go back in time. Now, I just popped the data into R. I didn't bother writing any code for this. As I said, know your tools. And this is the decision tree I got. So I don't have a pointer, but it's pretty clear pretty easy to see what's going on. At every point in the decision tree, we have a condition. You have each branch is saying what the condition is. What I have is the number of tweets which fulfill this and the percent of retweets. So for example, you can see that it's usually, the best results are usually between 12, uh, 12 30 to 3.30, and this is Israel time. By the way, another decision you have to do is what time zone do I use, because that can have horrible impact. And usually, not Tuesday or Friday for some reason. But it seems that if you tweet at lunch on Monday, you're going to get the most retweets. That uh, seemed nice. So I went and looked and evaluated the data. Now, does anybody here know a little bit of machine learning? This is the ROC uh, the R curve and the AUC parameter, which saying basically to us who don't know, to those who don't know machine learning, any model which essentially is essentially random knows nothing then, you know, what, what can you say if you don't know anything? Ah, it might get a retweet, you might not. 50%. So that's the red line. Red line saying is a model which essentially guesses. And you want to be as far above the red line as possible. And what you have is actually the AUC is the integral of the blue line. So you can see that on itself, the model was so-so. It's, it's a good ROC, but on different modeling techniques, you can sometimes get it to 0 0.9, 0 0.95. And on evaluation, we drop down, which is to be expected. If you don't drop down, it's very real data. But we're still better than random. So essentially, we have a nice little data product. It's not very good. You can probably get it better. But there is something there. So, and the big question is, what next? So, as I said, there's quite a lot of features which we never looked at. Twitter has a built-in tagging called hashtagging. What's the problem with hashtagging? Not everybody uses it. Many people use it wrong, meaning you use the same hashtag as you meant to, but you will put spelling errors there. So you have to go scrub the data, figure out what you do with the many missing values. You also have an amazing source of data, which is the tweet itself. If I can classify the tweet saying, oh, this is a politics tweet and it gets retweeted, this is a tweet about my family or my kids doing something stupid, and it gets retweeted, it's probably Saturday. Actually, it turns out that's true. If my kids are doing something stupid, it's Saturday. But see, notice that it's correlation and causation because I'm in high tech, I see my kids on Saturday. <laughs> so you have to figure out what, uh, what's going on there. Do I need more data? For example, should I validate this across users or cluster users? If there's a lot of guys tweeting about politics, are their patterns the same? 
Is this something personal or is just Monday a good way to tweet about politics? Already here there's about a year of work, easily. Just trying to get the techniques better, get it more focused, get everything going on. And then you can have a nice product to sell for social media guys. This is when to tweet to get the most impact. Now can you monetize this? I don't know, I'm not a social media guy. And this is well, this was a good toy example, but in a business case, if I can't monetize this, what am I doing? Uh, people always ask about, why is Google doing this? Uh, why, is th why does Google do Google Earth or whatever? It can't monetize it. And basically, you're wrong. It just gets your eyes across the computer all the time. You're seeing more ads. Anything Google does is to get you to see more ads, which is fine. It's a business. They need to see uh, But if you can't monetize this, it's nice in academia. You want to be in industry, you have to figure out what to do. Okay, uh, the last thing is, if anybody wants to do data science on live person stuff, we have open APIs. You can actually play with our stuff. There's a list on apps, liveperson.com, of Israeli startups using our chat data for all their own products. Uh, it's worth to look at. And we have Facebook, Twitter accounts saying developments in the API. And thank you. We are, um, so we are hiring, so if you're interested, we're always hiring. <laughs>